Hello and welcome to the November 8th, 2023 meeting of the Amherst Conservation Commission. The time is 7.04. Uh, first up on our agenda is chair report. I don't have anything, um, so I'm going to hand it over to Dave Zomek. Great. Good evening, everybody. Hope you're being warm after yesterday's nice day and then that drop in temperature. So it's that time of year. Um, a couple of quick updates for all of you. Um, um, you know, one, just putting another plug out there. We do have a vacancy on the commission right now. Um, so we are accepting CAFs, citizen activity forms in the town manager's office. Um, so anyone you might know who's an Amherst resident who would like to volunteer to be on the commission would be great. And we're collecting names and CAFs and uh, those go to the town manager. And then, um, you know, we, we have a pretty straightforward interview process. So um, I'll keep tabs on those with Aaron and see um, what kind of applica applicants we get. Let's see, in, out in the field, Brad and Anthony are kind of wrapping things up. Um, you know, we'll work out in the field as long as we can and as long as the conditions allow. Uh, they're doing some field mowing now. Um, they're uh, working on equipment, getting things kind of put away for the winter. Certain pieces of equipment that go, you know, in buildings will be put away in the next three to five weeks. Um, and they're they're still out there doing some, you know, very minor, you know, board replacement on bridges, uh, fixing handrails, guardrails, things like that on on boardwalks and such. So a lot of those kinds of projects going on. Um, I think the most exciting um, trail project, field project that um, I think has happened since your last meeting is that the um, the, uh, the Pond Loop Boardwalk at Sweet Alice uh, Conservation Area um, that you uh, uh, approved uh, is completed. So Kestrel Trust teamed up, Brad and Anthony were there a number of days with uh, Stu and Luke, who are two staff members at the Kestrel Trust. And uh, I don't, I I passed some, some photos on to Aaron. I don't know if you have those this evening or not, Aaron, or whether you put them in the packet. But anyway, Aaron can send them out to you after the meeting or something. I don't want to complicate things tonight with, with that. But um, the, the boardwalk looks great. Um, our building commissioner weighed in, as well as myself and Aaron, and um, Kestrel did a great job. They donated all of the materials. I'm going to say I, I, I would estimate about $15,000 in materials. And uh, the labor was volunteer labor, Kestrel labor, and of course, Town of Amherst staff. So it looks really nice. And it, it reconnects the loop there. So very nice. What else is going on? Um, Another interesting project, uh, Stephanie Ciccarello, our sustainability director, has been working for many, many months with the gardeners down at the Fort River Farm. Uh, she was able to fund some, I would call it um, a, a vertical extension of the fencing there. Those gardeners have been quite <laughs> impacted by deer over the last two years. So um, there are now quite uh, attractive extensions on the fencing around the community garden. Um, so uh, we will now have an eight foot fence around the garden. Now, whether white-tailed deer can or will go over that, they might, but they're gonna have to work a little harder. Um, uh, the fencing also will close off the vehicular access that was there, which deer could have just walked through. And it also provides a uh, an extension over the two pedestrian entrances. So if you're out and about this weekend, um, they should be done, I would guess, by the weekend, installing that. And uh, sustainability funds went into that. Um, so kind of a neat project, and we'll see if it works. Um, there's still lots of little critters that crawl under and through fences, so you can never be 100%. But um, some people were really disappointed when their 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 crops were eaten last year and, and this year by deer. Um, what else? Um, we will be, when the Hickory Trail project comes up later, we I will be asking for a continuation of that to another meeting. Aaron and I did have a good consultation with Natural Heritage on some of their questions and concerns about our pond loop, or excuse me, our, our loop trail, ADA loop trail and the other trails at Hickory, but I think we're 
I think we're in pretty good shape and we'll have more information for you in two weeks. Um, we will be kind of ground truthing some of that. There's some, they've asked for some modest changes in the, in the um, location of those trails. Pretty, pretty straightforward things, moving it a little farther away from the Fort River and maybe um, trying to hug some other corners so that the trail doesn't fragment um, wood turtle habitat. So we'll have more for you in two weeks on that, but we we want to ground truth some of those things and then um, talk with Natural Heritage and then hopefully in two weeks, I hope we'll be able to close that out. We'll see if you're, um, you are impressed with our changes and satisfied. So, so some interesting things going on in the field, but, um, and we'll just play it by ear here with the weather. So happy to take any questions if you have not Thanks, Dave. Good stuff. Anybody have any? Oh, Jason, I see your hand up. Yeah, I just want to say that we were out at the Sweet Alice um, area loop trail this weekend, this past weekend, and the bridge was great. And uh, it was a great view, and the kids loved it, and it looked beautiful. So great work to everybody involved in that. It was really nice. Yeah, thanks. It's a great partnership with Gastrol. I think we're. I think the plan is to. There's a bump out in the, in the uh, small bump out on the um, boardwalk, and I think they're going to put a bridge. Oh, excuse me, a bridge, a, a bench, there, uh, facing um, north. I think looking at the pond. So, yeah. but yeah, check it out. It's that's a really hugely popular trail now. So, great. Um... Okay, with that, I think we can move on to land management updates. So we have the Mill River History Trail Project Committee update. And do we have our presenters? I see your hand up, Bruce. You just skip the minutes. Oh, sorry. Uh, approval of minutes <clears throat> for 102523. So I had discussed a few minor changes with Aaron on this. I don't know if they made it into the folder, but it was essentially just some corrections to names and such. Um, so given that, I guess I'm looking for a motion to approve the minutes. 4102523. I move to approve the minutes uh, for 1025-23 uh, as drafted. I'll second that. Andre on the motion, Jason on the second. Bruce? Aye. Andre? Aye. Jason? Aye. And I'm an aye. <clears throat> Thanks, Bruce. Okay, on to land management updates. Um, the Mill River History Trail Project committee updates. I don't know the names to look for. Sorry, Aaron, go ahead. Um, Michelle, are you able in attendees to add people as panelists? Because for some reason that option is gone from my um menu. I am. Um, okay. I don't so, have the um, PowerPoint in front of me, so I don't know the names yeah. to look for. Um, so if you could just pull in Meg Gage, and then I think she can pull in or she can tell us the names of the other people who are part of the committee that need to join. Okay. Meg, you're pulled in. We're just, yep, there you are. Start my video. I think uh, Brian Harvey is there. Jane Hi. Wald. Catherine Stryker. And I believe Hetty Startup was not able to be here. These are some folks from our committee. Brian, uh, Jane, and Catherine. Um, I don't see all those names. So if you're affiliated with this project, if you raise your hand, that would just help me find you and pull you in. Okay, got it. I see Jane. <laughs> Hi, Jane. Okay. Um, all right. Hi, Kat, I know Jane Catherine, and Meg. Catherine should, Catherine should be there. Yep, I just she's, texted her. she's joining. And there's Brian. And Brian Harvey. Oh, good. <laughs> all right. <I> can't. <laughs> Oh, 
All right. Hi, everybody. Great. Welcome. Um, okay, so we have a pretty full agenda and I want to leave time for some commissioner questions and such. So if you could keep this to maybe like five minutes, does that work for you guys? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Maybe awesome. even shorter. Great. Um, we're eager to make a very brief, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Brief uh, overview, although I see a number of new, new commissioners. So uh, we may make sure everyone knows what this project is. Um, this is a project we've spoken with you all about before. It's to create, to tell the story of Amherst history uh, from the indigenous people's time through the early 20th century in terms of things that happened along the Mill River and to create an annotated tr uh, trail along the way that people can walk and learn what has happened, what, what some of the various sites have been between the North Amherst Library and Cushman Common, almost ent entirely on conservation land. We've completed the first stage and have sent you the report, which I hope you've had a chance to look at, although it's massive, this is how big it is. And um, I wanna draw your attention later to one particular thing. This was a look, a detailed look at four sites, the two Roberts Mills that are between uh, Puffers Pond and Cushman, the canal that runs along the north end of the recreation trail and fed water, diverted water and fed it to the um, mill that's on Montague Road and the Cushman Clam Club, which was a men's uh, social place uh, where they ate clams and socialized. Um, we are now going looking for funding from CPA. We, we were funded by CPA. We're looking for a second grant in order to fund stage two which will look at nine specific sites that don't actually have remnants like those original four, um, but four specific sites of things that happened along the river oh, yeah. and three oh, yeah. contextual features, including the indigenous history, the sur surficial geology and the social, political and economic significance of, of these various activities in the context of Amherst. We hope to hire two half-time consultants for six months, a project manager and an archivist to look at these uh, additional 12 sites and working with you all, which we've just uh, uh, to figure out how to annotate this with signs along the way that people will be able to read and then with a QR code in their phones, click to a great deal of additional information possibly things they can listen to, people reading diaries and so on. There's a massive amount of history uh, and people just don't know it. Um, there was a huge, uh, but it's by 1775 when the American Revolution happened, there were already four or five mills on that river. Um, it's just a fantastic uh, history that we're eager to tell. And I'm going to um, stop because we want to be sure you have a chance for questions. Although we have a, a, a three of our committee members here who may want to add something. Jane and Brian and Kat. Or do you want to ask us questions? That was super brief, but. One of the Jane. things we talked about with David at a previous meeting was the signage, which will be in stage three, which we won't be dealing with yet. So, sorry, Jane, did you have a comment? Uh, not, not really a planned comment, but I just want to um, emphasize that the sort of the overall nature of this project is um, um, identifying and making uh, these sites that are already on conservation land um, more useful to the community of Amherst. Um, so it's kind of a marrying of conservation and um, um, history and historic preservation. Thanks, Jane. Brian, I see I see your hand up and hope you're on mute. You're on mute, Brian. Yes, I'm no longer on mute. The and, and just tying in with that. Um, when we look at the whole long development of this area, the last phase of it is when it was chosen to be put into conservation use because there have been all these activities for all of these years. But then the town's most conscious decision about this 
was to preserve the a, lot of, a large part of this area and to try to make it possible to um, carry this over for future generations in a much different use. So it's kind of it's kind of an interesting way of capping off the story of the area that you're there in a conservation area because that is the last sort of decision the community made about what they had in mind as a future for this area. Great, awesome, thank you. Um, any commissioner comments on this? Questions? Um, I had one, but I'm also on the CPAC. <laughs> so it's- oh, you are? We'll, we'll, yeah, we'll be talking about it then too, but since we're in the, so I see you Andre, but since we're in the context of the commission and unfortunately, the person most expert on this isn't here today. I just wanted to sort of bring to light the connection between the Mill River and the indigenous relationship with the river. And I mm -hmm. understand there's no written history and there's no dockets and trade and things like that, but there is um, an ecological history and that is is mm -hmm. fairly well known. And um, Alex, who's not here on the commission um, tonight, but he's, he's expert in this and there are things like um sea lamprey that may or may not still be here but they really drove the activities and use of the indigenous use of the mill river so while those things may not like have um you know written records anymore they they are sort of understood about the general land use of the place mm -hmm. and they're also somewhat contemporary and they have a connection to the conservation of the land, which is where it is now, as you said, right. Brian. So um, we can talk more about that. I actually consulted with our previous chair because she works for a USGS fish, uh, fish lab. And um, if you need any right. you know, expert on that, <laughs> we can connect you. But I just wanted to say that that's a right. really cool way to um, tie in the history with the current conservation context of the river. Mm -hmm. right. And there is, there is some history but it's not yes. written, but we do mm -hmm. know there was a trading tra route that went quite close to where the Mill River is, so. Yeah, and there's... even just sort of like seasonal land use, I think would be really right. tied to the migrations of the fisheries. Mm -hmm. Anyway, there's a lot you can right. sort of glean from right. general, um, you know, known migration fish ways and stuff. But anyway, I'm gonna hand it over to Andre because he's got his hand up also. Good evening. Uh, I don't have a whole lot to say other than the fact that I really support what you're doing, and I think it's a good good thing for our community to uh, to have uh, that history available to them at their fingertips. And I thank you for what you're doing. Thanks, Andre thank you. Bruce. Brian, um, did you have some? Brian. Brian, did you have? Go ahead, Bruce. We'll we'll get back to Brian. <laughs> Okay, so I just wanted to ask what uh, involvement Indigenous people have had in the that particular part of the project. Um, I know someone who might be you could uh, seek his advice if if they're if that's needed. Bill Latrell. Great. We can be in touch with you about getting his contact information. Sure, uh, I would advise that um, indigenous native people be included in the discussion about what you're gonna say and what you know and what you don't know and what they know, and it could be valuable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I fully second that. And I think Alex, again, would be interested in talking to you guys about that. And he's like currently involved in doing exactly this kind of outreach and working with indigenous tribes so he'd be a great resource yes okay anybody else um any public comment on this please raise your hand i i yep. I, I wanted to invite uh cat to say, say a bit about this project she's doing which is related to it based on her being a curious neighbor interested in horses <laughs> you may have read about it in the paper if we have a minute or two more. Yeah, maybe just a couple of minutes, Kat. Sure, okay. So um, I live right next to the library in North Amherst. And when they were digging up the foundations for the new extension building, I noticed a lot of old horseshoes being dug up. 
And uh, being a keen amateur historian, um, I asked what the plan was for them, and there was none. So I developed a project called For Want of a Nail. And the project is going to be a exhibition in the library extension, showing the horseshoes that uh, that I found and kept, and also a sculpture, very visible from the road, right next to 63, facing east, which will combine the horseshoes and uh, have a very sort of flowing dynamic about it to um, help like attract people to the idea that uh, you know history can be found objects as well and when you know what you're looking at and have an understanding of it uh, you can your imagination can run free with it and it connects you to so many other things so you know for want of a nail is about honoring the working horses that were around in amherst and did so much labor for um, the early community which is completely unacknowledged and uh, also to highlight the role of the blacksmith, which is a very universal skill, metalworking for hundreds of thousands of years around the world. Um, and uh, I'm in the final stages of getting approval from town of Amherst and the Public Arts Commission. They will have their meeting on November the 14th. And once I have approval for that, I'll go out fundraising. Blacksmith has already been commissioned. I've got a little website going called forwantofanail.info. And uh, hopefully we'll have this absolutely beautiful bust of a horse's head with a very flowing mane sometime in spring. <laughs> Thanks, Kat. So the trail will begin there and it'll go up to Cushman. Mm. Okay. Very nice. Brian, were you, were you about to say something? Yeah. All, all I was going Brian, to do you... was say that one of the things that we uh, we went back to the indigenous, <clears throat> pardon me, the indigenous topic. One of the things we discovered in phase one was a conservation commission document that is on a, it's about a four page. Dave and I have talked about this a little bit, a four pager on the history of Puffer's Pond. And that has a very provocative map, which we believe is uh, comes from the Mass Historical Commission, showing that various uh, um, travel routes of the pre-contact uh, indigenous peoples here. And it seems to go right up through your trail. And so we're very interested in right. trying to figure out how to get that more better documented and also talk about that as a place that was really the origins of the activity along that whole river valley. Great, thanks, Brian. Okay, um, I think I we need to one, keep moving on. I have on. one, I, I just Meg, have one I quick see Jane's, for... Hold on, Jane, um, okay. sorry, Meg, I see Jane's hand up. Jane, did you want to add something very quickly? We really need to wrap this up. Yes, just a minor footnote to uh, what Kat was talking about, uh, and that is the e existence of a, a long-running 19th century blacksmith shop on the site of the North Amherst Library, So, so uh, which was the source of the horseshoes. I, I just thought that was um, something to point out. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Jane. Meg, can you do it in a minute? Really fast on page uh, mm -hmm. figure 105 in our report from the first stage, this is message for David, is a picture of a tree that's almost falling down. And when it does, it'll cause a landslide down onto one of the foundations. It would be very cool to uh, cut down that tree. <laughs> figure 105. Okay. You me to, I'll send you a picture of it. Yeah, maybe offline destroy, that could be it'll, communicated. Yeah, I'll uh, do that offline. It'll destroy one of the foundations. Thank okay. you. I know you don't like to chop down trees, but. <laughs> All right. Um, thanks, guys. Very, thank you. Um, very interesting. We look forward to the, the multiple phases of the project. So thanks for presenting. Um, okay. Good night. <clears throat> okay. Can we do anything in a minute, Erin? Um, um, UMass spill update. That's a you know fairly positive news. If <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so I was able to get confirmation <clears throat> from DEP that there were no um, wetland or waterway impacts from the um, uh, spill that happened um, at the UMass property um, at 300 Mass Ave um, and Lincoln Ave, and uh, there. They have an LSP who is um, 
contracted on site and they also have been working with um, DEP emergency response for the remaining cleanup items. But um, <clears throat> yeah, they've they've caught up on their SWIP reports, um, getting them to me and those are in your packets. And um, yeah, it's it's resolved. So I just wanted to make sure I circled back on that. <clears throat> Great, thanks. Um, I, I see one public with a raised hand, um, Danny Hartman, if, if this is in relation to uh, the Mill River Trail. Um, <clears throat> if it's not, maybe take your hand down and we'll take public comment later. But OK, I see his hand up. I'm going to let you in. Just please keep it to you know a minute or two. Yeah, I'll keep it brief. No, I'm the professional engineer that handled the spill. So I'm just here. OK, there OK, great questions. I, I took my time to join the meeting. And I also wrote up to respond to your notice of violation. I spent uh, quite a bit of time compiling photos and giving you very detailed descriptions of everything you had asked. And I did email that to the board's uh, email address two hours ago, but your summary is very accurate. It is contained. It did not reach any um, critical features of the environment. It was largely within the um infrastructure that was there and uh we are just going through the steps with the DEP to close it out uh most mostly administratively now so that's where we're at great thanks Danny commissioners yep. any questions or comments on this okay I don't see any um thanks for checking in Danny so I think we can move on this one thanks for coming to the meeting though <clears throat> um, all right, one more minute, maybe um, update on the tree removal. I think it, everybody had that in their packets. We asked some questions about why the tree needed to be removed. This is in relation to the UMass um, project, and they came back with some very detailed um, reasoning, which sounds good to me. Did anyone have any comments on that, or can we consider approved? Okay, hearing none, I think we can check that off. Okay, we're at 4.30, Aaron, so do you want to open um, our first hearing? 7.30, but yes, Oops. absolutely. <laughs> um, I'll pull up the <laughs> hearing screen first so we can go over that. Thank you. Well, oh, so Michelle, somehow you have been assigned host and not co-host. Could you make me co-host? Yes. I don't know how I manage that one. I click the button, let me know if it worked. Yep, it did. Okay, great. <laughs> Writing my sheets. You know what? They are upstairs. Erin, do you think you could help me out with the opening procedure? Um, or I could just yeah. Let me see <laughs> if I them. can. Let me see if I can um pull it up on. Well, I've I've got to stop sharing my screen. So if you can read from the slide while I stop sharing, I can grab yes. it from my email. I'll try to. You want me to read from? Well, the, the hearing slide where we tell people how the hearings go. OK, sure, I'll do that. All right, so we're moving into hearings. General procedure for fairness to all applicants. Each hearing has 20 dedicated minutes on the agenda. The hearing structure is five minutes presentation from staff, five minutes for comments from the applicant, five minutes of public comment, or two minutes per person, five minutes for the conservation commissioners, or two minutes each. All plan revisions are required now by Wednesday prior to the meeting at noon. For our presenters, clearly state your name, the address of the project, and who you're representing, as well as if you have preferred pronouns. Bruce, I see your hand up. I just want to confirm that it's Wednesday at noon, a week from the meeting, not the the day of the meeting. Thank you, Bruce. I'm going to update my <clears throat> cheat sheet. 
All right, Aaron, should I run and get my my hearing? Um, I'm zeroing in on it. Um, just bear with me one second. Do you want me to just pull it up on the screen, Michelle? Would that be helpful? The meeting call. Oh. <laughs> she, she probably ran away to go get it. It seems like she did. Andrea's vice chair, this is your big opportunity. I can, I could certainly read. What do you think, Aaron? You want me to read it out? Um, so yeah, you can, you can read this out and then, um, the, uh, you've got to read the, um, on the, um, hearing slide, just the specific to the project description. I got it. Oh, there oh, she is. She's here. All right, this public hearing is now called to order. This hearing is being held as required by the provisions of Chapter 131, Section 40 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth, an act relative to the protection of the wetlands as most recently amended in Article 3.31, Wetlands Protection under the Town of Amherst General Bylaws. Okay, so this is an abbreviated notice of resource area delineation, Pure Sky Development Incorporated on behalf of W.D. Coles Incorporated, represented by Goddard Consulting for the confirmation of resource area boundaries on site limited to areas that fall within 100 feet of the proposed solar installation at Shootsbury Road, map 9B, lots 11 and 12, and map 9D, lots 27. Okay. So I'm going to pull in um, Andrew Chabot, um, or... If I'm saying that wrong, please correct me, Andy. Um, and if there's anyone else from um, the project, oh, Steve Riberty, I'll pull him in as well. Um, I see. Um, I thought I saw Tom Reedy, but now I'm not seeing him. Oh, there he is. Okay. We moved to the, oh, you keep jumping around, Tom, <laughs> on my list. Okay, there he is. Okay. I think I got everybody in now. Hi, Andrew. Hi, Steve. Hi, Tom. Hi. Welcome. Hi. Okay. Um, do we want to start off with your comments, Erin, or shall we give them their five minutes to present? No, I think um, having them present, we've already discussed um, the peer review. So they're, they've been provided with the estimate for Emily Stockman. Um, and um, I think just give them an opportunity to to present and then potentially some public comment or commissioner comment. Okay, great. Um, go ahead, guys. Great. I can just uh, quickly lead off and then I'll probably just hand it to you, Steve. So yeah. thanks everybody for your time tonight. My name is Andrew Schwell. I'm with Pure Sky Energy. I'm here to uh, speak to the submitted ANRAD for the uh, parcels off of Shoesbury Road, located zero Shoesbury Road. Um, this particular area had a uh, formally been delineated back in 2020, received an ORAD uh, that has since expired. So we are seeking to uh, redelineate and renew that process, which is why we're here tonight. So um, I know Steve has gone and uh, taken care of a lot of the initial work here. So um, I'll leave it to him to speak to any um, technical issues or technical questions, but I'll just kind of hang back and answer any other questions that might come up. So. Okay, and yeah, thanks, Andy. Um, yeah, so we we basically re looked at the the original delineation that was done in 2020. Um, expired, I think maybe a month or two before we got out there. Um, pretty much all the flags are still there. We reevaluated all the wetland lines. We we filed an ANRAD for portions of those lines that would now you know potentially put jurisdiction close to or toward the proposed project on the site. You know, we're not proposing the project now, but you know, everybody kind of knows where it is internally. So, you know, not, the entire site wasn't re-delineated, only portions of it, you know, probably 75% of the site. Um, for the most part, things haven't changed. It's only been three years. Um, the wetlands are essentially in the same location. Um, we did make some of the wetlands slightly larger. You know, a handful of flags moved. 
we renumbered the flags to kind of make it a little bit more logical on the different wetland system numbers, but we kept the the, the flag number at the end. So there'd be very easy to compare, you know, flag 30 to flag 30 from the previous delineation to the new delineation. We just changed the, you know, like the, the wetland ID number. Um, and we added some newer flags down by the road where there was um, a, the, the town drainage swale kind of goes underneath the, the driveway and turns more into a, a, a channel or a bank that flows off site, um, off property to the south, I believe it is. So that's a newer wetland that's on there that wasn't in the previous ANRAD. Everything else is in the previous ANRAD, you know, hasn't changed, you know, substantially from what we what was originally filed and approved and peer reviewed back, you know, three years ago. So that's kind of the gist of what the what the new um, ANRAD filing is. Um, most of the flags from the original ANRAD were still present in the field. Our new flags are pretty much on the same exact vegetation at the same location. You know with new numbers on them um so it's fairly easy from what we saw in some of the initial field walks to kind of see where you are and see where the wetland boundaries lie out in the field so you know that that's kind of the summary of of what's kind of happened out there and, and what's in the new anrad filing so you know we've all been talking about um getting the peer review consultant involved and I'm assuming we'll be out there in the field reviewing everything over the next next couple of weeks um I know, Aaron, that you had mentioned um, wanting to have a plan that showed the original ANRAD, the ORAD approval line on kind of married with the new line to see the differences. We're in the process of putting that together now, but it's a little bit of work just because that original line and all that data came from the previous consultant. So we have to get that from them and then work, put it into the CAD and get everything to line up. So it, it it's a little bit of a process. It's it's happening, but I don't I don't know how fast it will happen. We don't want it to like slow up the review, but um, I, I can let Andrew talk about if he has any insight on how fast that might happen on uh, not on their end, but on the you know the the surveyors end to put all that data together. I would think it's probably a week or two to 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 put all that together and vet it internally. I think that a week is a, a pretty safe. Uh, assessment, Steve. Yeah, we were told um, just today that they're aiming to send us over those documents, hopefully, hopefully tomorrow or um, early next week. So I'm hopeful that we can throw everything together pretty quick after that. And it'll probably take a, a little, a couple days to set up the contract. So, um, you know, probably yeah, be pretty point. well aligned when the contract's done and the map is prepared. Great. Thanks, Andrew. Stephen, I'm going to take public comment now, so please raise your hand. Okay, Luke, I'm going to allow you to talk. Please um, state name, address, and preferred pronouns if you have them. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Luke Legere. I'm an attorney with the firm of McGregor, Legere, and Stevens in Boston. Uh, he, him, his is fine for me. Thank you again. I represent Jenny Callick and Bob Bazooka. Uh, they are butters to the project site at 147 Shootsbury Road in Amherst. Uh, my clients are committed to ensuring that the valuable natural resources out on the WD Cal's property are protected. Um, I'm here tonight primarily just to sort of introduce myself as we do expect to participate fully in this ANRAD permitting process and any subsequent permitting processes uh, that may come before the commission. Um, my clients are firmly aligned with Smart Solar Amherst's mission of supporting environmentally responsible development of solar energy. And we do firmly believe that that starts with a complete and accurate delineation of all of the jurisdictional state and local wetland resource areas on the subject property. Um, and that brings me to really the, the reason I wanted to comment tonight, which is more of a question that I'm hoping to put to the applicant through you, Madam Chair, and that is uh, whether we would be allowed to have a wetland consultant participate in a site visit to review the delineations that was just mentioned. Um, certainly we would you know, expect to do that at the same time that Ms. Stockman's out there so we wouldn't delay or hold anything up, um, but, that's a request we would make of the applicant if you're willing to put that to them, Madam Chair. Thanks, Luke. So you're requesting that a a, a second uh, wetland scientist be out with Emily Stockton during her 
review, third party review of the site. Is that That's correct. I anticipate that we will be uh, retaining, or, or my clients, I should say, will be retaining their own wetland consultant. And so the idea would be to allow that individual to take part in the site site visit to review the delineations. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to check in with Aaron on this. Um, this is an unfamiliar um, activity to me, but Aaron, there's first, is Emily Stockton okay with this? And then of course, is are there project proponents okay with this? So um yeah, I mean, I, been done? Yeah. I would have to ask Emily Stockman, it's new territory for me um, to do something like that. I would say it would be really important to um, <clears throat> check with KP law relative to the legality of that. And also, um, you know, obviously the landowner and applicant um, would have to uh, give their permission for that to move forward. So I guess those are just my initial comments, but I'm certainly willing to look into it more and come back with some additional information. Thanks. Um, Andrew, Stephen, Tom, do you have any comments on that request? Uh, I think that uh, we will have to, I'll turn to Tom. He would probably be able to address it easier than me, but I think we would have to um, discuss that with the landowner before um, being able to say one way or the, the other. Okay. Um, so that's the response, Luke. I think maybe offline communications would be the best way to um, coordinate this. So maybe you could get in touch with Aaron and by that, um, Andrew, Tom, and Stephen and the landowner. Does that sound okay to you? Sure, that's fine with me. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, any other public comment? I don't see any hand raised. Okay, I'm going to move on to commissioner comments. Any comments or questions from the commissioners? Okay, seeing none, Aaron, do you mind putting up the PowerPoint with yes. the proposed motions? Make the motion. I'm ready. Two. I'm Go ready ahead, to, Bruce. Uh, I move to request authorization from the applicant to employ an outside consultant under MGL Part 1, Title 7. Chapter 44, Section 53G, retaining and contracting with Emily Stockman of Stockman Associates to review the resource area boundaries and flagging that fall within the project footprint and or impact the project footprint, um, in parentheses, have buffers within 100 feet of the project footprint, un un parentheses, and resource area boundaries that may cast over the project area, in parentheses, within 200 feet of the project footprint in the case of Riverfront. All right, Bruce on the motion, looking for a second. Second. Andre on the second. Andre? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Jason? Is Jason still with us? I can't see everybody. He's, um, he's, connecting. Second. He's, he's connecting. Okay, I'm an I, and now we'll just, he seems connected. Jason, you there? I am here. Okay. And your vote is? I. <laughs> thank you. All right. All right, thank you, Stephen, Tom, Andrew. Um, oh, there's a second I motion, I'm sorry. I move to continue the public hearing for Shrewsbury Road and RAD to 750 on 11-29-23. Thanks, Andre. Andre on the motion. I'll second that motion. Jason on the second. Andre? Aye. Jason? Aye. Bruce? Aye. And I'm an aye. Okay. With that, thank you, Stephen, Tom, and Jason. Good night. Yeah, thank, thank you. Everyone. Good night. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, um, let's see, yes, 7.35, notice of intent. So we have, this hearing is being called, being held as required by the provisions of chapter 131, section 40 of the general laws of the Commonwealth, 
an act relative to the protection of the wetlands as most recently amended in Article 3.31 Wetlands Protection under the Town of Amherst General Bylaws. And this is a notice of intent. The engineers on behalf of Amherst College for repair to culverts, road maintenance, hazard tree removal, repair of bog and bridges, and long-term routine maintenance at multiple parcels on Amherst College campus, map 14C, lot 73, map 14D, lot 1, map 14C, lot 73, map 17B, lot 1, map 17A, lot 57, map 14D, lot 2, map 14C, lot 89, map 17A, 1, lot 62, map 17A, lot 68, map 17B, lot 3, map 17B, lot 6, map 17B, lot 8. Good job. So, <laughs> uh, do we have the uh, the project proponents here tonight that might want to present? No, they're um okay. because they got their butter notification or their certified abutters list at the very last minute, and there was a, obviously a lot of abutters um, associated with this project. They um, needed some additional time to properly notify abutters, so they will be notifying abutters and indicating that the hearing date and time has changed. But we will need a formal motion to continue this hearing um, to account for anybody who showed up from the public hearing notice, the legal ad notice. Okay. Um, if there's any public questions, I mean, it'd probably be better to do that when our project proponents are here. So I think we're just looking for a motion to continue the public hearing. I'll move to continue the public hearing to 11-29-2023 at 7.40 p.m. Second. Jason on the motion, Bruce on the second. Andre? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Jason? Aye. And I'm aye. Okay. Um, I'm just going to pull the project proponent in before I share my screen. Um, should be Maya. There she is. I'll promote Maya to a panelist. If there's anybody else joining for Maya, just raise your hand and I'm going to share my screen. So, Michelle, if you can pull them in. Sure, not seeing. Um, I can no longer see them. So maybe Maya can let us know if there's somebody else. Okay, this meeting is being held as required by the provisions of Chapter 131, Section 40 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth and Act Relative to the Protection of Wetlands as most recently amended in Article 3.31, Wetlands Protection under the Town of Amherst General Bylaws. This is a request for determination, Maya Tal, to determine whether work to construct a single family home with associated site work is subject to the Wetlands Protection Act and whether the area and or work are subject to the Town of Amherst Protection bylaw and 9 through 11 Poets Corner map 15B lot 131. Hi Maya, welcome. Thank you. Hello everybody. Can you hear me okay? We can. Okay. Um, Aaron, do you want to give us a five minutes? Um. Sure. So um, I'm going to pull up site visit photos. So bear with me for just a minute. Um, we did schedule a site visit for this project, and um, I don't think no commissioners were able to attend. Um, the there's really the only real um, proposed alteration, I would say, is the driveway, which I think is about 60 or so square feet of impact within the outer extent of the 100 foot buffer zone um, for the corner of the driveway, which the um, applicant is restricted to that particular area because of an existing access easement um, that basically limits the location where they can put the um, driveway apron coming off an existing shared driveway. Um, uh, the When I was on site, I observed that there had been an existing spoil pile on site, which um, was historically existing, um, but I it appears that um, some of the vegetation had been removed off of it. Um, and in an effort to sort of clean up the area. And so this is the spoil, picture of the spoil pile here. The area to the left is the um, project site, which is outside of 100 feet. So the 100 foot kind of comes just on the left hand side of the spoil pile. Um, I did speak to the applicant about using straw wattle rather than the um, filter fabric silt fence, just because I felt like it would hold up better in the 
um, winter time and the silt fence wasn't towed in, so it wasn't really functioning. Um, there was also a, a stump here. Um, I basically advised the applicant that this spoil pile, which was a remnant of the original um, subdivision construction uh, from Poets Corner Road, should be immediately removed um, and or tarped for the winter. So um, I think that their intention is to remove that as soon as possible. Um, and I think that they may have already installed the straw wattle. But overall, yeah. um, I don't think they're exceeding the 20% alteration threshold for this. Um, there was alteration already within the buffer zone. And I think that they're proposing to maintain most of that as sort of yard area. Um, so with that, I'll just um, turn it over to Maya. Yeah, I mean, you basically covered everything. The only thing that uh, you haven't covered that I think is also important to mention is that there is an existing sewer line that runs through the easement that we have on our property, and that happens to fall within the 100 feet buffer zone as well, and we would need access to that while we're doing the construction. And then once that's done, it's going to be covered back into this lawn. Uh, but I also... Um, adjusted the driveway a little bit to see it as far back I can take it. And it's about 42 square feet now that's really touching within the very edge of the 100 feet buffer zone. And that's really the maximum we can do within the terms of the easement that we have to go through. And if if anybody want a visual, um, I can open up a plan to explain. Thanks, Maya. So, um, in addition Sorry, to I the, I also have pictures of the uh, straw wattles placed on site. Okay, um, commissioners, if you if you want to see those, raise your hand. Um, so, I I heard in addition to the now forty two square foot, you say that there's also going to be some temporary impacts into the buffer zone that I don't think we really covered in our um, packets. So um, is that on this plan that we're looking at right now, Erin? Yes, um, I don't know. I mean, you can't see my, um, uh, so I'm, I'll just try to explain it on the image. So the, for, first of all, on the right, there's an image of the um, straw wattles that we put on, but uh, there's a few things that are in red uh, notes. So they are the most obvious ones. So the one in the middle, which is, what we're seeing now is access for connecting to the existing sewer line. And that's where the um, that's where the sewer line runs and that's where we would need to go into, into it. And then the little triangle at the very bottom uh, that shows 42 square feet, that is the overlap of the proposed driveway um, on top of the 100 feet buffer zone. And Aaron, if you wouldn't mind scrolling just a little bit down, you can see the, the red line is the, the easement line where we cannot pass. So we're really pushing it as far back as we can to avoid the buffer zone as much as we can. Thank you, Maya, we appreciate that. So um, just to just to confirm where the temporary impacts are, there that circle and like where I mean, what, what's, it's going to be like a truck or so, a, I see, um, digging a pipeline, basically. Yeah, there's a little bit of trenching that has to be done towards the, the sewer line. So that circle with the S on it is, that's a manhole that's existing on site. And uh, about 15 feet down, I think, uh, up north is where we would have to do the connection. So we would need to trench into that. And then the water line you will see down further down with a W right next to the closed driveway. So that is beyond the, the limits of the buffer zone. So it's really just the sewer line that we have to connect because that's an existing town uh, sewer line. Okay, thanks. Um, commissioners, any questions about this? Okay, I see none. Um, so I, my only comment is that while this is under the 20%, it is in the buffer and it is a permanent impact. And I think that, um, you know, our 
we're moving towards a recommendation to not require an NOI for this, but um, my ask of you is to do some voluntary um, mitigation for the six or I guess 42 foot square foot. And that really could include just some high bush blueberry, vaccinium, some kind of native plantings. Um, many of them are, you know, attractive in the fall and good for birds and great, but just something that's maybe not lawn that sort of remediates some of the effects. Um, our bylaws do have like a pretty substantial preamble about why we don't want any impacts into the 100 foot buffer. And I just want to honor that and ask you to maybe just do some voluntary mitigation in that in lieu of having to file an NOI for this. So I just want to hear. Okay, that's great. Um, thank you for being willing to, you know, be a good steward of the land in that respect. Um, any other questions or comments? Erin? I just want to make sure we don't forget about public comment. Yep. Chris? Um, what is the plan for removing the pile of soil and the and the stump if it's still there? We are gonna spread it out and feed it. It's basically topsoil with some debris that we try to remove as much of the debris as possible. But there were there were like big chunks of concrete in there left from the construction from twenty something years ago. So we removed the big concrete. Chunks, and we're just going to spread out what is supposed to be topsoil and feed it and don't bother it, basically. All right. I guess my only comment would be that, that if it's been sitting there that long, there's a reasonably good chance that there isn't a lot of nutrient left in the soil that's in that pile. So you may need to augment it with some uh, assistance in some way. I see. So we also have a big uh, fresh pile of topsoil that we uh, scraped off the top of the rest of the property. And we can always add some of that in yeah. to make sure we have better topsoil. Okay, and so I understand the timeline for that is sort of as soon as possible. Is that is that the communication that you've had, Aaron and Maya? Yes, okay. Yeah. Um, okay, great. Um, if there's any public comment, please raise your hand. I'm keeping an eye on it. I don't see any. Okay. Is everybody satisfied with the discussion of the spoils pile and uh, buffer impacts? Yes. Okay. With that, I'm looking for a motion and maybe Aaron, you could pull it up. Thank you. And Maya, maybe you could just be in contact with Aaron about the plantings that we just discussed. Thanks. I'll read it. I move to issue a positive determination checking box five, indicating that the work proposed is subject to review and approval by the Conservation Commission pursuant to wetlands protection in the town of Amherst general bylaws, article 3.31, and a negative determination checking box three, indicating that the work described in the request is within the buffer zone as defined in the regulations, but will not alter an area subject to projection. Therefore, said work does not require the filing, uh, filing of a notice of intent subject to the conditions, uh, parentheses, under WPA and wetlands bylaw and regulations, under parentheses, listed in the wetlands administrator hearing report dated 11-8-2023. Do you guys want motion. me to just share the, um, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Aaron. I go ahead and get the second on the motion. I was just going to share the, um, the, um, conditions. Just for clarification, the motion says, uh, not an area subject to projection. Is that supposed to be protection? Um, where are you seeing this on the in the lines, Jason? Four, uh, third line from the bottom. Yes, so that's supposed to be protection. That's a typo. Okay. I'll second that motion. Bruce on the motion, Jason on the second. Bruce? Aye. Jason? Aye. Andre? Aye. Namanai? 
And Erin, you want to? Yeah, I do. I um, bear with me one second. I I did just do sort of very standard conditions on this one because it's pretty minor. Um, and sorry for whatever reason, my um, my memo was kind of lost in the um, shuffle of the slides. Just trying to make it larger so I can share them on my screen. Okay, so, um, so just that a member of the Conservation Commission or myself can enter the property to do periodic inspections of the erosion control. Um, no machinery shall pass the erosion control barrier. Um, the applicant shall notify um, me prior to activity taking place in the buffer zone and uh, that provide the name and telephone numbers of the contractors who are working on site, uh, that the erosion controls shall be maintained during construction um, and that um, additional controls shall be added if necessary. The stable construct construction entrance shall be provided during construction. So just to make sure that material is not tracked into the um, existing driveway and the resource area, all stockpiles um, of soil uh, from stored for more than one day shall be surrounded by a, uh, a row of silt fence and or covered with a tarp. And um, I'll do an inspection at the completion of work once the site is stable. Um, so that the erosion controls can be removed. Thanks, Erin. And do any edits or, I don't know, caveats need to be made given the need for the access to the sewer line and the temporary backs? Okay, great. No, because that's just, that's all within the work area that was defined in the plan set. So we'll reference that in the determination. So that'll be covered. Got it. Thank you. All right, Maya, thank you. You guys have a good night. You too. <clears throat> All right. Um, next up, we have AMHAD Development Corp for construction of a parking lot and detention basin in the buffer zone to bordering vegetation wetlands at 28 Greenleaves Drive at 13D lot 79. I believe this is already open, right, Erin? Okay. Yes. And yep. is anybody here for this or are we just moving to continue because we did not have information in time? Correct. Yep. They're okay. They're still working on the revisions for this one. So we just need a motion to continue. Okay, looking for that motion. I will move to continue the public hearing to 1129.23 at 7.55 p.m. pending receipt of additional required information. I'll second that. Jason on the motion, Andre on the second. Bruce? Aye. Jason? Aye. Andre? Aye. And I'm an aye. Okay, um, notice of intent for Amherst for the construction of a handicapped accessible trail system and bridges, resource area mitigation and restoration activities. Work is proposed in the bordering land subject to flooding, bordering vegetated wetlands, bank riverfront buffer zone at 191 primary lane, map 19D, 20A, lots 10 and 59. Um, so we're still waiting on NHESP comments on this and you had your site visit. Is there anything else you want to update us with or should we just move to the motion? I see Bruce's hand up, but I'll let Dave go first. Oh no, happy to take Bruce's question. Okay, go ahead, Bruce. I thought I heard Dave say earlier that he had received the letter and that they had good suggestions. Um, Aaron, maybe you could clarify that. I th think I, I'm not sure if we received an email or we covered all that in a in a in a phone conversation, a Zoom call. Yeah, so we we did meet with Natural Heritage to review the plan. Um, we had a number of um, representatives from Natural Heritage who we went through painstakingly through the whole plan um, <clears throat> with. Um, revisions, suggested um, relocations of the trail, and um, 
we are in the process right now of sort of ground truth things. So about half of the site has been ground truth for the trail location. Um, and we're hoping um, uh, by Monday we'll have ground truth um, the remaining trail segments so that we can update the map and provide that back to Natural Heritage. Once Natural Heritage gets the updated map, they would issue us a determination letter at that at that time. So that's that's sort of the more detailed explanation of where things stand. Great, I, I misunderstood. <clears throat> Yeah, so at this time, we would seek to continue that to your next meeting in two weeks. Hopefully, we can turn that around. It might be a little optimistic. I think we can do it on our end, and we'll just see if Natural Heritage can um, can do it on their end. I will say they were complementary of the comprehensive nature of the NOI, um, and they acknowledged, you know, all the work that went into it and and Thanks in large part to Aaron putting together all that um, that material and the the supplemental material and reports and maps. Um, but they said, "Boy, there's a lot. You got a lot going on there." So that's where they wanted to comment. And and again, it was not a wholesale changing of of trails or anything like that. They just wanted us to maybe consider a couple changes to the path of um, or the uh, location of a couple of the trails. You know the loop trail, for instance, one section moving it a little farther away from the from the Fort River, and then likewise up on the the North South Trail. So, as Aaron said, we'll um, I'll probably get out there tomorrow or more likely Friday, and do a little ground truthing of what they suggested, and then we'll go back and forth with them, and then then they can um, submit a letter for your review and and our discussion in a couple of weeks. Thanks, Dave, Chris. So is there any process uh, by which we should um, continue the public hearing for two meetings? I mean, we you look at the list at the end of this document of how many things are on the list for the 29th. Does it, can you go ahead and move it even further? Because is it really that important to do it three weeks from now? Well, I will say that we are under quite a bit of pressure now with the grant funding that we have so Fair enough. If, if we have to you know if we have to continue it again from the 29th on we will and we'll take two minutes of, of the commission's time on that date but i'd love to keep it on your agenda just in case natural heritage really moves this along quickly because we our grants really need to be completed for both of these trails by june 30th of 24. okay that means, yeah so Appreciate it. Thanks for those good questions. Um, any anybody else? Any public comment? I don't see any hands up. Okay. With that, looking for a motion to continue the public hearing for 191 West Pomeroy Lane to 1129, 2023 at 8 p.m. So moved. I'll second. Bruce on the motion, Jason on the second. Bruce. Aye. Jason? Aye. Andre? Aye. And I'm an aye. <clears throat> okay. Um, next up is SWCA on behalf of University of Massachusetts for the construction of a gravel parking lot and associated stormwater structures in the 100 foot buffer zone to bordering vegetated wetland at lot 13, Olympia Drive, map 8D, lots 15, 13, and 3. So this one is also seeking continuance. So looking for a motion on that, unless there's any comments. Do we, we have, sorry. Go ahead, Jason. We have uh, continued this several times now. They had raised concerns about this project, you know, taking too long to get a third party in there and so on and so forth. and. They just keep asking to um, have continuances. Does anybody have any idea why? Has anybody been in contact with anyone? Is the project, are they scrapping the project? Does anybody know anything as to why we keep continuing this? Yeah, I'll, let, I'll let Aaron there, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Will yes. there why expire at any point? Can, can it expire? Yeah. Um, 
as long as we're continuing to a date certain, we can sort of keep kicking the can um, on this one. And a little bit of this is just, as you can tell, with the volume of applica applications that we've received that I was a little bit um, uh, short on time to reach out to them and have a conversation. Um, and also because I was a little worried to nudge them forward, considering that at the next meeting we have eight hearings. Um, so I do want to check in with them and, and see where things stand, but um, I also don't want us to have, um, you know, uh, a meeting that's so overwhelmed with with content that we can't get through everything. So I sort of, I, I checked in with Michelle about it and said, I haven't had a chance to speak to them. I'm kind of feeling like I don't want to push too hard if they're doing their due diligence. Um, but I think maybe once we get to our December meeting, when things have calmed down a little bit, um, at that point, I would reach out to them and try to get some more information. Um, I guess that's that's kind of my my best recommendation for right now. Yes, and at a certain point, a third party review may not be possible because it'll be winter. So um, I think they understand that and what the risks are. But good questions, Jason. Yeah, and thank you for. Uh, yep, go ahead. All right, you know, Michelle, you just mentioned a third party review won't be possible in the winter time. If we do decide that we want to have a third party review, potentially at this next meeting. Does that mean that they'll have to wait until the spring? I think, but correct me, Aaron, that's like up to the um, discretion of the third party reviewer, whether or not the conditions allow for a accurate delineation, but yes, go correct. ahead, Aaron. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. So there's potential potentially, yes, yes, potentially, yes. Okay. Okay, unless there's any further questions or comments, looking for a motion to continue again. I move to continue the public hearing for lot 13 Olympia Drive, notice of intent to 11-29-23 at 8.05 p.m. I heard Bruce on the second. Um, Andre on the motion. Bruce? Aye. Jason? Aye. Andre? Aye. And I'm an A. Okay. <clears throat> Notice of intent. Oh, oh. This meeting is being held as required by the provisions of Chapter 131, Section 40 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth and Act. No, I was on you. RDA. Oh. Let's go. I had to flip pages. Okay. This hearing is being held as required by the provisions of Chapter 131, Section 40 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth and Act relative to the protection of the wetlands as most recently amended in Article 3.31, Wetlands Protection Under Town of Amherst and Mormon Bylaws. And this is a notice of intent for Tetra Tech on behalf of Fort River Solar 2 LLC for construction and operation of a 6.35 megawatt direct current ground mounted photovoltaic solar facility and upper to upper tenant components at 191 West Pomeroy Lane map 19D lot 10. I'm sure I said that wrong, but <laughs> with me. Okay, and we have somebody here for this. Yes, Tetra Tech, Sean Foster, pulling you in. Please raise your hand if you're also associated with this project. And I see Matt Moyen. And Aaron, you got him? I got a couple folks in. Okay. Yeah. If I missed anyone, please raise your hand. Ryan. Yeah, good evening. I'm Sean Foster. I'm with Tetra Tech. I'll be uh, speaking on behalf of the project tonight. Uh, I'm joined by Matt Moyen uh, from Tetra Tech also, and we have some representatives from uh, the client here on the call as well. So just to give a brief back background on the project, um, and is it okay if I go ahead and share my screen, Aaron, or um, is that something that you typically do? Or Nope, you're, you're um, fine to share. 
Okay. So just a little bit of background on the project. It was previously approved under an order of conditions back in um, uh, May of 2019. And there were several minor modifications, administrative, administrative modifications that were made through March of 2022. The permit expired this past August on the 25th. So we we're coming before the board to uh, re-permit for an NOI for an order of conditions for the proposed work. Uh, some of the work has previously been uh, completed and, um, and I'm gonna bring up a plan here in a second to you know, demonstrate um, you know, kind of what we have, uh, what has been completed to date. If you could just share with me, if you can share, if you can see my screen. Um, we cannot yet. Be... Okay. Um, you should have, you should have abilities to do so though. Okay. There we go. Okay. So, um, you know, the, the project started construction this past year. It, uh, um, the erosion controls, including the um, construction control entrance and silt fence around the complete site was installed. Some of the fencing was installed as well. And the, exist, uh, the proposed gravel access road was completed as well. So we're using that as kind of our basis of the starting point for this new NOI. It's kind of our existing conditions. The, the site is proposed to have two solar arrays, one on the eastern side and one on the western side, uh, totaling 6.35 megawatts. It includes uh, electrical equipment and, um, and some uh, remediation uh, uh, mitigation uh, because of the endangered species at the site. Um, the proposed, and I'm gonna walk through each portion uh, of the project here. So the entranceway is, is already completed. Um, the proposed work and the entranceway would still include the uh, utility poles to be installed um, from West Palmeray uh, Lane all the way back to the solar field. Um, there's an existing bridge deck uh, that goes over the Fort River. The deck will be replaced, but the substructure will be remain. So there's no in-water work. We're proposing just to replace the, the structure of the deck um, to provide more sufficient loading to get equipment out to the site and uh, to allow uh, other vehicles and, and better access to the site. Because right now the deck doesn't have a high loading, but the new deck will have a loading close to 31 tons. And this plan set that was provided as part of the NOI includes uh, the details for redoing the deck. But again, I wanna be clear, there's no in-water work. It's just the, 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 the deck structure itself will be replaced and in, in kind of the approaches to it. This is a photo of the Eastern Array. Um, you know, and I, I do want to reiterate, all, the layout is substantially similar to the work that was previously approved through the administrative approvals. We've made some minor modifications to the stream crossings. Um, but other than that, the, the project is, we haven't really changed the, the, the layout at all or the, you know, the extent of the solar field. There's two stream crossings for intermittent streams that we're going to replace. They're currently... Um, currently have pipes kind of conveying the stormwater through these intermittent streams. We're gonna replace them with precast structures that are gonna meet the wetland crossing standards and will also provide a better um, habitat and kind of movement for uh, wildlife in the area. This is the second stream crossing. So the two stream crossings are between the Western Array and the Eastern Array. The arrays themselves will be fenced in with a fence and a gate. Some of that, most of that fencing has been installed. The panels and the electrical equipment has not been installed yet. The site has been permanently stabilized through the summer and SWIP inspections and a third party environmental monitor as required as under the previous order of conditions has been conducted. There's a niche, there's an uh, open niche app permit for the uh, habitat for endangered species that it's requiring us to do uh, remediation and mitigation within kind of a buffer zone between our limit of work and in a uh, river. Um, that permit's still active and we're committed to, you know, completing that work as part of the project. 
you know, gen general phasing would be to complete the, the, the bridge decking, the river crossings and the flood mitigation, because we are impacting some of the uh, some of the flood storage and we're pro providing compensatory flood storage as part of that. And the second phase would be to complete the, the solar portion of the, the project, including the utility poles. And, and then the final piece would be, you know, any mitigation, planting and restoration as required by the NESHAP permit and as dictated on these plans. Um, but I, one thing I want to go back to is for stormwater, we, we kind of looked at the existing conditions, which the road is already installed. So um, the need for stormwater is fairly limited as panels are considered to be pervious under, you know, the state bylaw. So we've done some mitigation of stormwater in the sense of um, by the crossings directing stormwater to level spreaders to, you know, we were counting the overland flow as, as treatment and mitigation for any peak rate increases associated with the, the wetland crossings. You know, I think we were asked to kind of wrap this up in five minutes. So that's, that's a brief overview. I was gonna turn it over to you know, the board for any questions that we can possibly answer. Thank you, Sean. Um, I see your hand up, Bruce. Aaron, do you wanna give your five minutes or should we? go right to commissioner comments and also to the public please raise your hands and i'll keep an eye on you if you have any questions um yeah i'll i'll jump in i did um include some comments um on the memo that i issued to the commission earlier this week um i just want to say overall um that i you know i think reviewing this project under the sort of the guise of the previous permit is um, I think a an effective approach here. Um, I do think that there might be a couple pieces of information that would be beneficial for the commission to, to see or have. Um, <clears throat> so uh, just one specific example of that would be for the stormwater, um, on the original notice of intent application, there was no stormwater calculations that were completed. And so um, there's nothing for us to look back to and see what the pre pre development um, uh, runoff uh, calculations were. Um, so there was no calculations done at that time, which I'm, I'm not quite sure how the project even was permitted without those. But um, nonetheless it was so I looked back to see if I could locate them was unable to find them and I just think it would be useful for us to see what the pre-development runoff calculations are that way we can be assured that the installation of the roadways the installation of the expanded equipment pads and gravel areas um, doesn't increase the post-development um, runoff calculations and that if it did it would provide an opportunity for us to retrofit some stormwater on the site, which may provide some um, reduction in peak runoff rates. So um, maybe some water quality swales or something to that effect, which was something that um, I had spoken with one of the project proponents about in advance of this filing in hopes that there would be some potential um, addition of structures like that considered. Um, <clears throat> Let me see what else. Um, I mean, I don't want to run through all of my comments. They've been provided to the to the applicant and to the commission. Um, the there's a little bit of minimal detail, I guess I would say, on the flood mitigation area. Um, I would be interested to see sort of a more detailed concept of what that the construction of that flood mitigation area would look like, particularly because it looks like it's. Um, being proposed on top of an existing gravel access drive. Um, so just to see sort of what the um, more more detailed grading um, would look like in that location. Um, I've already talked about stormwater. Um, yeah, don't feel a need to go through okay. every single okay. one of them okay. if you don't want to. Um, okay. Matt, do you want to quickly respond to one of Aaron's comments and then we're going to move to commissioner questions. Yeah, more more of a question than a than a response. Um, in terms of going back and looking at the the existing conditions prior to the construction of the road, 
What are you envisioning looking back pre application? So golf course condition, I just want to make sure where, when we go back and look at this, we're evaluating what you're expecting us to evaluate. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I mean, I'm assuming that there was some evaluation of this done already. It just may not have been submitted to the commission. So that would also be a potential option if there was any calcs run previously by the applicant and they just weren't submitted. Um, but yeah, that's exactly what I'm looking for. Just because the access roads, even though they are already constructed, they were part of the overall project. And so because we're looking at the overall project, to make sure that there's not going to be any sort of storm water issues wh which might cause um, erosion or washout or environmental you know resource area damage um, once the project is installed and functioning yeah okay that that's helpful to understand and i can tell you you know here that we don't have any concerns of that but i i know okay. you're gonna you guys are more likely than not going to want to see some numbers to, to back that up but when you look at a, a golf course condition where you have manicured lawn go into a, a, a meadow condition, which is gonna exist, you know, as we move forward here on this project, it's gonna be substantially lower in the post condition because you've got that denser growth vegetation that's not a manicured surface. So, you know, if that's, if that's good enough for you, great, but it, you know, we, we can certainly pull some numbers together and give you a table that that represents that for you. Yeah, that would the be- model, The model's built, so it's relatively easy effort. Yeah, that, that's exactly what I'm looking for. Um, there were <clears throat> there were a couple other comments um, just relative to phasing. I know um, in the initial presentation that was touched on, but just if we could get a little more detail on the phasing, um, and you know if there was other specific questions, it might be helpful to to talk about those offline. Yeah, I, I, we we definitely took a, a glance through your comments earlier today, and I don't think there was anything in there that was earth shattering. It was just more making sure your expectations and our understanding were aligned. And then in terms of the, the stormwater improvements along the road, we, we heard you and um, for the crossings, that's why we proposed what we did. Uh, originally, stormwater was basically gonna run off at the crossings and go directly into these intermittent streams and the resource areas. And what we've proposed here is to put up some timber curbing that extends the flow path away from the stream pushes it through a level spreader and over what's called a qualifying pervious area, which is basically just dense vegetation for a, a length of 25 to 50 feet. And that gives you water quality and quantity benefits. It's, it's a measure recognizes DEP as a low impact development um, improvement. So we put four of those in, two on two at each crossing, one on either side, just to help protect those resources that, that are immediate to it. Um, and we could, the other thing, I just from a stormwater perspective, there are a number of other locations along the existing drive that do qualify as these quote unquote qualifying pervious areas. So if it's beneficial, we can show where those are on the plan. But the, the gist of it is the majority, if not all of the roadway between the east and west arrays and, and on, the, on the eastern side of the east array, if you follow where I'm talking, <laughs> Uh, are all qualifying pervious areas that are going to give you the water quality and quantity treatment you're looking for. Thanks, Matt. Bruce? Not sure when we discuss uh, what I'm going to ask, but so in effect, this is a project inside a bigger project. The town is doing a project all around this project. And my interest is to hear from both Tetratech and Dave, how do the, particularly the endangered species mitigations, but the, in general, how do these two projects uh, engage with each other? That's a good question, Bruce, and it's a big picture question. So I just wanna back up a little bit back to Aaron's like bullet point questions that we all received and just make sure that that has been tr um, transmitted to the, to the project applicants and that I think what we're looking for is um, a response point by point and you know what you've been doing Matt and telling us and just putting that into writing so that the commission can review them point by point so does that sound good to you guys and and then we can move on to Bruce's question yeah we're Sorry. happy to provide written responses yep. okay to great all yep. of Aaron's comments okay uh, one, um, just real quick, Michelle, yep. if you don't mind, there was one other item uh, that you know, I think Sean and I both wanted to bring up the the wetlands 
topic, there was mention of looking at the wetland delineation that was done for the town project and potentially swapping that out. Uh, you know, I can't speak for Sean, but my initial reaction there was we have a, a little bit of concern showing a line that is not representative of the work we've done and hasn't yet been approved on plans we're stamping. Um, we're certainly happy to look at that delineation compared to what's shown on these plans and you know identify where there may be some differences and take those into consideration. But just just wanted to put that out there to be open about it and gauge kind of reaction from from Aaron from the commission on you know our feelings about it. Okay, thanks. And that maybe that ties into Bruce's question too, because there's some dovetailing here. Aaron, I don't, is Dave still with us? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, do you want to answer maybe more specifically about the wetlands really quick? And then maybe Dave and you can get to yeah. the dovetail part. I mean, I think that the wetland boundary will be con confirmed as part of the notice of intent application that's currently under review by the CONCOM for the, the trail system. Um, so it's just sort of a more accurate representation of, of the trails. I wouldn't ask you to rerun your, all of your calculations necessarily um, for the, you know, mitigation and everything else. Um, it's mostly just um, to recognize that there's been an updated delineation. It's included on an updated plan that's currently before the CONCOM and is probably gonna get approved. Um, maybe even in tandem with this one. Um, and so just just to sort of recognize that and and that the conditions from this original delineation have updated. And I didn't even realize when the permit process was sort of initiated for this one that there was that dramatic of a difference in the delineation. But I think that there were a couple changes, um, particularly like this area that we're looking at right now. I think that the wetland now carries down a little bit further and that's a symptom of the the property rebounding pretty significantly since the um the uh, golf course changed or closed so um anyway that's my comment on that okay, okay. yeah it sounds like there might be some discrepancies that you guys can probably collaborate with offline on that yeah does that sound yeah. okay okay great yeah. all right bruce back to you did you want to restate that or did you have your hands oh. still up I'll just yeah, I'll just say there's a, a pretty big project inside the even bigger one. And I just carry particularly with regard to endangered species like the wood turtles, are the things that the the solar project is doing in are they meshing appropriately with the things the town is pr proposing to do when they butt up against each other? Great question. I, Dave, do you want to yeah, yeah, go ahead? Yeah, no, it's a great question, Bruce. I'll, I'll try to address it. Um, so, so yeah, clearly, you know, the town entered this project, overall project for the 150 acres and the purchase, and I've said this before, with with the solar already a given. So, 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 Pure Sky um, has you know permitted this this 26 acre solar through the CONCOM as well as natural heritage. And they're coming through with this additional step for the reasons that were stated earlier. So in their project, it requires, you know, for 26 acres of impact, 17 acres of restoration and a permanent conservation restriction to be put on the north side of, of the Fort River. So I think, you know, that is is where Pure Sky is. You know, we're working, you know, on our side of the project. I think, you know, the, the first part of our project to really kind of look look comprehensively at the 150 acres was to complete, you know, the full wetlands delineation. Again, Pure Sky, um, formerly AMP, did not need to do a full wetlands assessment. So we 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 started by gathering all this information. We, you know, hired somebody to do all the wetlands, all the vernal pools, riverfront. So we've extensively mapped both sides of the Fort River. We also hired somebody to do the restoration plan. That being said, all of that is kind of informing 
as we move slowly, you know, through these next steps, the logical next piece of the puzzle for us was the trail system. So, because that was one of the major pieces uh, of the acquisition story that we told to the town council that convinced them and other boards and committees to support this and, and purchase the land. So that's kind of where we are. I think we are keenly aware of the rare and endangered species that are on the property. In addition to the terrestrial turtles, we also have those species that are found in the Fort River watershed, including a federally listed species. So all of that being said, natural heritage is holding us to an extremely high standard for a course that is now um, gone from a 150 acre heavily manicured uh, limed and, and herbicide application and fertilized application to, you know, what we see out there today. So we're really pretty happy with that. And and the feedback we've gotten from natural heritage is some of the species they're monitoring out there seem to be um, really uh, taking advantage of the new habitat that's been created out there. So with all that being said, I think we're we're being very careful to plan our trail system, which is really phase one, to align with you know the goals and protection for those species. A great example is you know, using as many of the existing cart paths in our NOI, we we stay very close to many of the existing cart paths that have been there for 60 years or more. And then we're also going to be using a uh, shared space like some of the access roads, uh, what was stated earlier with the, uh, the bridge over the Florida River that's going to be rehabbed. That will be used very sparingly by uh, Pure Sky to check on their array throughout the year, but there won't be a lot of heavy traffic on there. And the, the plan is that there will be pedestrian access over that. So we're we're being very careful and, and taking a very high road with natural heritage and with our planning. We also are going to be held to some mitigation, you know, in our in our uh, NOI, we list mitigation and restoration as part of our work. And then we are also going to be required to put a CR on part of the property. Um, so that is coming down the line, which the commission will be involved with and the state will be involved with as well. And then finally, you know, when all said and done, when you start backing out, start from 150 acres, you have 26 acres of solar, which is under uh, a lease agreement for the next 20 years minimum. And then you subtract 17 acres of the required a uh, 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 sea art area for pure sky, then we subtract the sea art area required of the town, you're really left with under 10 acres, probably closer to five or six acres around the clubhouse that has any development potential whatsoever. The rest of the land by and large, given uh, floodplain, wetlands, vernal pools, uh, riverfront areas, will be uh, managed uh, according to the restoration plan. So it quickly goes from 150 acres really down to the frontage uh, around the clubhouse that has any, I don't want to call it intense uh, uh, or, or uh, intense development uh, potential, but that's where it is, the parking lot and the, and the former clubhouse, so. Okay, thanks, Dave. And, and Bruce, I believe as far as like the comprehensiveness or of the of the two different plans happening here, the same people doing the NHESP permitting or reviews and suggestions are doing it for both. I mean, I assume that's true. And so the same people are out for each site. And I have confidence in those people that they are making something cooperative that's um you know more comprehensive between the both the town plan and the solar plan if that's um yeah, that addresses what, I, what you're thank you yeah but, did you have I, another I, question well oh, an example yeah. would be what is the 17 acres of pure sky mitigation what is it actually going to do and is it complementary to enhancing of detracting from what the town is doing on its side. And some kind of an analysis of that would be helpful 
just to reassure and, and the extent of communication is is it between the town and Pier Sky directly, or is it through Natural Heritage that they're the mediator of this of those uh, actions and discussions? I can answer that very quickly. So, um, and again, I don't mean to answer for for Lawrence or Pier Sky, but the, the short answer is the the um, the CMP that was that was developed uh, the management plan for the project um, was a, a cooperative effort between Pure Sky, the town, and, you know, with heavy review by the Natural Heritage Program. So that okay, involves- That's really what I was trying to get to. What's that? That's what I was trying to find out. Yeah, so that is locked in stone. And Lawrence, I see his hand is up and he can talk about that, but that requires extensive planting and, and we are, our future management of the remainder of the land will need to dovetail with what happens on the north side. Much of the restoration that we will be involved with will be on the south side and some of the north uh, east quadrant of the property. So absolutely, there will be coordination and communication between those those two uh, those two plans. Okay, so there's a comprehensive management plan that includes both of these projects, and I think that gets to what Bruce was concerned about. Erin, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, there's like a 400-page CMP, which I can send to Bruce, which okay. details <laughs> the management in the 17 acres. I did see Lawrence's hand, too. I don't know if he's yeah. still... Yeah, <clears throat> I don't see it up, or I can't. But, uh, I, I took it down again. You and Erin pretty much covered it. It was, uh, yeah, the... Uh... The CMP applies to the whole site, all 150 acres. Um, the and then there's the specific 17 acres uh, that will be in conservation. It's not just going to be left as is. There are uh, improvements proposed, including uh, nesting habitat for the turtles and uh, a meadow and what and uh, native plantings and things. So it is it is very co comprehensive, and uh, I'm sure the towns will fit into the uh, the general plan um, with the amendments that's needed as a result of what you're. And, and I would just add our trail, proposed trails purposely avoid um, or limit the impacts to that 17 acre mitigation plan on, on the north side. So we we're proposing to remove one of the bridges that connects north and south uh, uh, pieces of the property. So, so we've given it a lot of thought. I, I still think we will learn a lot. There will be bumps in the road. It's not perfect. And you know, we're going to work with Pure Sky and we're going to work with the Natural Heritage Program. And as I said, we had a almost a two hour call on this last week. And I think we're going to have another one before your next meeting. So um, this is a very unique site ecologically. And, and we're going to be held to an extremely high standard, just like Pure Sky was, as we develop our ideas for the site. And just one final comment for me uh, is the... The reason why we've stuck to the already uh, approved plan is that both uh, uh, NHESP and the CONCOM uh, and the town have, have already done that. And your plan is based on where our uh, our final layout is. So nothing we're proposing here is uh, is going to cause the town to change any of the plans that they've been working on over the past several months. Good. Thank you, Lawrence. OK. Um, so I know we got to yeah. go, but if any if any members of the commission want to see that CMP, I'm sure Aaron can send a link to it. I would love to see that CMP, yeah. so please do distribute it. It's a quick right. read. <laughs> it sounds like it. OK, thank you, everybody. Um, OK, so we have a list of questions from Aaron that's been transmitted to um, project applicants, and we said that we'd like some point by point responses to them um, so that we can review that. And unless any commissioners have any more comments on that, Andre, see you up. I'm not sure that we've uh, garnered any public comment yet. Yep, just getting there. Um, I, <laughs> I, yeah, please raise your hand public if you have any comments in general, just raise them when you've got it and I will take them in due time. I'm not seeing any hands up. So, um, Sean, Lawrence, and Brian, do you, do you have what you need to move forward with this? Um, the next steps, just in terms of the, the clear questions and what Aaron's looking for. Okay, not seeing any other questions. So, 
Yeah, go ahead. John. Yes, we do. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, okay, commissioners, I think that given that we're looking for some additional clarification and information for the applicants, we're looking to continue this hearing to our next meeting. And Aaron, do you mind putting up our motion? Can you guys not see my screen? I could read it. Okay, thank you. Uh, move to continue the public hearing for 191 West Pomeroy, Fort River Solar LLC, notice of intent to November 29, 2023 at 8, 10 a.m. It says a.m. there, but <laughs> right? thank you. I hope. Sorry. <laughs> I'll second that. Okay. Andre on the motion, Jason on the second. Bruce? Aye. Jason? Aye. Andre? Aye. And I'm an I. Okay, thank you, Lawrence, Ryan, and Matt for attending. And we'll see you later. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think that's it for our hearings. Um, and okay, I guess the update from NHESP on the forest cutting plan um, that was conveyed to us. Um, did anyone have any questions on that? Basically. It's non-jurisdictional. Erin, <laughs> um, did you want to say something? Yeah, the, um, I did speak with Ali Akandi about Michelle's questions and relative to the forest cutting plan that was recently approved that had um, the NHESP letter associated with it. And um, speaking with Ali, basically what I understand is that the, the information from Natural Heritage was guidance. So they're providing guidance on the cutting plan as opposed to having sort of a regulatory role in administering it. And so the the administration of the forest cutting plan is done by the service forester. Um, and he, that is the individual who monitors the site um, for compliance with the NHESP permit. Um, so it, I did send along the links um, from Ali, but um, that basically kind of addresses the, the question I think that Michelle had asked at the last um, meeting. Which is as is under current law in Massachusetts, we really don't have any jurisdiction under forest cutting. So there it is. Yeah, and I, I've i talked to Dave about this. I'd really love to see Amherst develop a forest cutting bylaw. Um, I There was one formerly in the town of Sturbridge where I worked and it was a wonderful bridge between the forestry community and the conservation commission and we really helped to um, uh, improve communication and beneficial relationships between foresters and the commission so that we could be more deeply involved in forest cutting plans um, and just DCR in general so I really think something like that would be a long-term benefit to the town to develop <clears throat> excuse me thanks Aaron just something to keep in mind. Okay. Um, uh, we have the next step is the UMass dredge permit extension. And I think Kristen is here for that. Thank you for... Hi, Kristen. Thanks for hanging on. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Kristen McDonough with SWCA, and I'm here on behalf of the University of Massachusetts. And um, UMass has an existing order of conditions. The DEP wetland file number is 0890670, and it's associated with um, uh, dredging the campus pond and the university has been faced with a number of constraints beyond their control, primarily due to COVID, but also due to funding. And they've had to push the project back to um, summer of 2025. So UMass is requesting a three-year extension of the existing order of conditions. Okay, thanks, Kristen. Commissioners, any questions about that? Um, I'll just say that this is being submitted with in you know with ample time, so there's no going over requested um, 
buffer there. So no concerns with that. Any, any questions? Okay, seeing none, um, if there's any public comment, please raise your hand. I see Bruce's hand up. Go ahead, Bruce. Kristen, when was the last time that the pond was dredged? Actually, um, there's a lot of sediment that accumulates um, in a sort of, I want to say it's like a water quality structure. Um, the, this is a very loaded question, Bruce. So a lot of the a lot of the sediment from downtown Amherst filters through the Tanbrook trash grate, which we talked about earlier. Um, it goes through that culvert and then it accumulates in the pond. And there is this kind of sediment um, water quality structure that needs to be cleaned out quarterly. And they remove tons of sediment out of that every year, every, quarterly, every four times a year. Um, the pond hasn't been dredged for several years, but it does need to be dredged. It does need to be lowered um, in order to compensate for flood storage. And there are several other pieces of this permit that I don't wanna get too in the weeds about unless you guys have questions we can talk about that more. Um, but the, in a nutshell, the Tanbrook Inlet structure needs to be redesigned and permitted. Um, there's uh, a, a master plan that needs to be approved and that includes um, cultural resources. Uh, there's just a lot of different components. So this is a bigger project than just a simple pond dredge. Okay. okay. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay. Looking for a motion to ex issue an extension to DEP number 089-0670 Mass Campus Pond Dredge Order of Conditions for a three-year period from current date of expiration. So moved. Second. second. I'm going to give it to Andre. <laughs> Jason on the motion, Andre on the second. Jason? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Andre? Aye. And I'm an aye. Okay. Thanks, Kristen. Thank night. you. Okay. So, Michelle, if it's okay, I'm just going to jump in on the request for minor administrative changes. Please do. Um, Okay, so for I'm just going to cover them both and hopefully we can just do back to back motions on these um, for 51 East Pleasant Street, um, you may recall that there was a, re um, a request for minor administrative change that was submitted to us prior to the previous meeting, and it was really lacking detail um, and uh, there wasn't really a plan associated with it. So I did request some additional narrative explanation of what work was proposed and um, a planting plan that showed what was going on uh, as far as the bank restoration. That information was provided to us. And so at this point, um, I'm comfortable with us moving forward on approving it. It basically re replants the, um, the uh, stream channel that is behind the um, Bertucci's old former Bertucci's now Garcia's uh, parking area. And I think that the proposed planting plan will be a significant improvement over the existing um, sort of uh, vegetation that's growing there, sparse vegetation that's growing there. Um, the a second one is a mass DOT beaver deceiver. So previous, about a year ago, the commission approved um, the repaving of the southernmost portion of the Norwatuck um, rail trail and um, there was an existing sort of makeshift beaver deceiver that was in place um, under one of the culverts going under the the um, bike path which was removed during the construction process and um, mass dot just omitted the um, reinstallation of a new beaver deceiver and so what happened was 
the beavers immediately moved in as soon as the beaver deceiver came out. Um, so they'd like to just reinstall the beaver deceiver with a flow control device there to keep um, the beavers from flooding out the bike path. And I don't have a problem with either of these um, minor administrative changes. Okay, any comments, questions? Bruce. So on the um, uh, East Pleasant Street, and there's a lot of silt fencing looks pretty old it's still there mm -hmm. it's, was there it's left over from a previous plant set of plants no um they the, their original permit was actually to repave the parking lot um so they they came through with their their original permit was to repave the parking lot which included expansion of the curbing um, or not expansion of the curbing, replacement of the curbing. It also included um, a uh, uh, invasive species management because both sides of that that little tributary to the Tan Brook were completely covered with Japanese knotweed. So they've gone through a multi-year treatment process of the knotweed at this point and the treatment of the knotweed is basically resulted in the bank of the this little tributary basically being almost completely void of vegetation except for a couple grasses and spindly kind of uh you noticed <laughs> yeah so um they're going to be planting a, a significant number of um of dogwood down there um small dogwood shrubs so i think it's going to really provide a nice native um, uh, root base for that um, uh, bank all the way along it. And um, hopefully yeah. it'll provide some native structure to hold the yeah. regrowth of the Japanese knotweed to some degree. <laughs> I have a question. Do they weed it? Because, I mean, I'm thinking about the Fort River restoration project and there's still those plants in but bigger than those plants and way leafier are the invasives that are coming in next to them and it just seems like a little bit of maintenance could go a long way in which which project are you referring to michelle um, River? but yeah by the um the community gardens you can see where these plantings oh. are getting overtaken by non-natives oh. and just on this bank, like the knot we just grows in so early and so fast that yeah. I could just see it being overtaken very quickly for like slower growing um, woody shrubs like dogwood. So I was just wondering if there's yeah. any intermediary, I don't know, caretaking involved to help it get a leg up. Yeah, I mean, I think they're they're also trying to they don't they didn't really like the aesthetic of the Japanese knotweed taking over. So I think they're trying to create a better aesthetic back there, too. But certainly in issuance of the minor administrative change, you could include a condition that they continue to monitor and remove or cut knotweed um, for the duration of the permit. Uh, I don't think we really have I mean, we could we could ask them for the duration to, to do that. But um I think that's kind of the, the as good as it's going to get. What about having a condition that the native plantings remain dominant to not just survive because over three years they could still survive, but in you know year five or seven they'd be completely overtaken. Like just something that's maybe it's just on this like kind of really eroded waterway and it's like prime knotweed habitat and yeah. I don't know just something I, to the effect of slightly tinkering with the performance standard so that um, it's not knotweed, a canopy of knotweed over small saplings of dogwood that are alive, but not thriving. If, yeah. You know I mean. mean, I think absolutely like, you know, they've asked for a change to the permit. So I think you can condition that change how you see fit. So um, whatever language you'd like to incorporate, I would suggest doing that. I think just adding um, maybe that the restoration plantings are remain the dominant uh, overstory of the um, area would, would be sufficient for me. I think that gets to what I'm trying to say, but open to suggestions from anybody. Um, are you saying that they should they should also weed the native vegetation if it starts to come in, or are you saying? only 
I don't think there would be a native, to... yeah, what well, would be a native vegetation that would overtake those so quickly? I mean, well, I mean, there's a ton of herbaceous wetland plants. Yeah, okay. Sedges, rushes. Um, well, that wouldn't be terrible. Um, yeah. I don't know. Does anybody have any input on this? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I would word it um, with the conditions that the uh, applicants ensure res restored plantings and native vegetation remain dominant because it you know we can't condition that the plants remain dominant we can condition that they do, that they ensure that good point I think that's a great idea, though, Michelle. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, I'm just having now seen sort of the trajectory of plantings versus very fast-growing herbaceous um, vegetation. It kind of needs to be reconciled about what is success over such a short time period as three years. Um, anyway, thank you, Erin. Um, I'm totally happy with that. And I think this is a great improvement. So looking for a motion. Unless there's public comment, of course. I move to approve the minor administrative change uh, outlined in email dated 10-31-23 and submitted restoration plan dated 10-30-23 to the order of conditions DEP number 089-0682 with the condition that the applicant ensure that restoration plantings and native vegetation remain the dominant re, remain dominant in the uh, restoration location second um, andre on the motion bruce on the second jason aye bruce aye andre aye no, no. Okay. No. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, do we need a motion to for the Beaver Deceiver? I will move to approve the minor administrative change outlined in correspondence dated 10 23 with attached plan and Beaver Solutions documents for DEP number 089-0702. Second. Andre on the motion. I think that was, I mean, sorry, Jason on the motion. Andre, that was you on the second. Um, Jason? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Andre? Aye. I'm an aye. Okay. Stanley Street Pickleball Courts. Um, <laughs> so I did put draft um, <clears throat> conditions in the folder. I apologize because that was a very last minute addition today. Um, I used a very standard, those very standard boilerplate with um, erosion control inspections, uh, monthly monitoring reports, um, you know, very standard. So I, I don't know if anybody has any comments, but it was relatively straightforward buffer zone only project. Okay, no comments, no comments from the public. So raise your hand. Seeing none, I'm looking for a motion. Move to I move to approve the order of conditions DEP number 089-0722 with special conditions under the Wetlands Protection Act, attachment one, and town of Amherst Wetlands Protection by Law and Regulations, attachment two, as drafted. Second. Bruce on the motion, Jason on the second. Andre? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Jason? Aye. And I'm an aye. Okay, um, so we had some monitoring reports. Was there any comments on that? Or, and um, lastly, public comment. So raise your hand if there's any, anything else. Okay, not seeing any. I think we're done. Yes? I will motion to adjourn. <laughs> Thank you. Second. 
Jason on the motion, Bruce on the second, Jason. Oh, no, it wasn't me. Oh, sorry, Andre on the second. Jason? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Andre? Aye. I'm an aye. Okay. Thank you guys. That was great work. That was a really intense agenda. We moved through it really quickly. So great work. Let's um, see next week, next uh, in three weeks. Before you go, can I ask a question about the the agenda that you have for November 29th? Okay. Is there anything dramatic that we need to know ahead of time, or are there site visits linked to these that we may be asked to go to? Yes, we're going to need to have site visits for Ball Lane, Hawkins Meadow, and 296 um, Pomeroy Lane. Um, I think we've had site visits on all the others, and I'm going to have to set up site visits on Monday. Um, we ha we do have a couple weeks, but obviously Thanksgiving falls in the middle, so there, there will be site visits. Um, yeah, I'm... I'm not expecting any major, major surprises other than we're just going to have to, the next meeting, we're going to have to really um, be efficient to get through it because it's going to be another mm -hmm. intense agenda. But um, I think, I think we can get through it and we will get through it and I'll just try to be as prepared as possible to have recommendations for you. Thank you, Aaron. Okay. Well, thanks, right. everyone. Everyone. Good night. Have a good night, guys. Good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.